Uh, we're going to uh, keep going, and uh, next up is uh, John, so from, I guess, billions of friends to billions of emails. Uh, John from MailChimp. And so um, j just a couple of things. So the, the next three talks are a little longer, uh, and the general idea is to go into a little bit more depth. Uh, so I'm always open to suggestion and talking to you guys either after or, you know, by, by email. Um, but, you know, over the months, uh, had some feedback that uh, people liked, you know, longer talks as opposed to panels. So I think you know we'll we'll, we'll keep alternating. Uh, but uh, you know, let me know how that uh, how that works out. I've also asked uh, the speakers to be fairly tactical and practical in what they talk about, so that uh, especially for those of you guys who have been coming here regularly, so that we don't end up with a you know a bunch of talks about how great big data is, uh, but you know, focus a lot more on what's actually actionable. With that said. John. All right, great. Thank okay. you. My mic's already on. Awesome. So I'm John Foreman, and I'm getting my voice back after a cold, so I may have a coughing fit or two during this talk. Um, I'm a former operations research consultant, uh, so if any of you have ever done OR, that's where I am. And I, I came from doing consulting for a lot of large businesses, and then I went to MailChimp, which is not a large business. We have about 200 employees in Atlanta. Are there any MailChimp users here? Yeah, hands, lots of hands, great. So we're one of the largest email service providers in the world in terms of users. We have about 4 million uh, users at this point. I think it, it blows up around Christmas because everyone's like, got to put the Christmas newsletter out for the local whatever. So everything explodes. But last time I checked, 4 million users, somewhere between 6 and 7 billion emails sent every month. That'll probably be 10 billion by the end of the year. And then we, we track opens, clicks, unsubscribes, etc. So we have several billion actions that come back in when people send email out. And we got a bunch of domains that are really large. So I showed up at MailChimp two years ago and I met this guy. This is Greg. And Greg is a graphic designer. Uh, I'm an analytics guy. I was sort of the first one. And so I just met this graphic designer, and then I met Fabio, another graphic designer, and 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 our apparel designer. And he makes shirts like this, and this is the billboard outside of our headquarters. That strip club is not our headquarters. Our headquarters is behind the strip club. <laughs> and we make stuff like this. These are our Freddy action figures we've been giving out. Uh, this is Aaron, our head of user experience. He wrote a famous design book called Designing for Emotion. This is Ron, our art director, who designed the logo for my artificial intelligence model called Omnivore, which I'll talk about. And this is Ben, our CEO, who is a graphic designer. So <laughs> I showed up at MailChimp and really quickly realized most companies are not in the business of analytics. Um, being an analytics consultant, I had just always thought, oh, every, the world just runs on analytics. And I showed up at this company and realized, wow, the reason why MailChimp is so successful is because they focused on improving the product and improving the user experience. That's what they're really good at. If you've used the site, you know it's, it's real clean. It's been designed really nicely. They go through these redesigns every couple of years to focus on, okay, what are pe how are people using the site now? How do we, we focus on that? So just recently we had a big redesign that focused on mobile, so now you can use it on a tablet, and it's great. And so what I decided is if I'm going to do data science at MailChimp, I need to get in line with this idea, right? I need to focus on improving the product and improving the user experience of that product. And that really helped me because when you see examples from other companies out in the wild, generally they're, to improve, they're sort of to impress investors or the media. So this is an example from a a restaurant review site and they've curated these these keywords and you can just pick them and you pick a city from a list like I can't even pick Atlanta here so I pick San Francisco and I can pick hipster and see that hipsters are in the mission this is not helpful in any way for me as a user of the site right this doesn't improve the user experience it just sort of flexes your data muscle so this isn't really in line with what my colleagues were doing so I could write stuff like this off similarly Here's my social network on a, this is a professional social network. I can actually visualize my graph. So I'm in the middle. I can see that I'm connected to Hillary Mason. I can see that Hillary Ma Mason exists in some cluster of other people that I'm friends with. And I can see that some of these clusters are colored different ways. And so I can look at that and be like, wow, I'm connected to people. It doesn't actually help me as a user in any way, right? It just sort of flexes this sort of data muscle. So I can forget this 
and focus now on doing what all my other colleagues were doing is what I decided. So how was I going to do that? I came up with this tic-tac-toe chart that I shared with the data science team and said, we're going to do this. We're going to provide insight and capabilities for our customers. And we had two customers, internal customers and external customers. Internal customers are just the people we work with. External customers are our users. And right now we spend about 20% of our time doing insight, which is just one-off reporting or one-off sort of consulting engagements. And we spend about 80% of our time building tools or capabilities because when you build a tool, people can use it over and over again and it's just awesome. Okay, so I'm gonna go real quickly. I don't have a ton of time, but I'm gonna to try to hit every corner here so I can just give you a flavor for what it's like to do data science at just a, a mid-sized business like this. So internal insights. Um, this is where our support team sits. We have 200 employees, about 100 of those are support personnel. So they do chat and email support. And this team just started to grow and grow and grow and grow because we provide chat support to all of our users all across the globe. And it became very difficult to schedule these people, right? So we had two people on the support team in Excel trying to schedule everyone. And it, it kind of looks like, I don't know what that video game is with the little marble that hits the little blocks and breaks them, but it started to look like that, right? Where some of the people counted as a whole person. If you were in training, you counted as half a person. The black lines were people that were assigned to email all day, so they weren't available for chat. They had a forecasting model down at the bottom that shows demand, and they had to slide people around and slide their lunch breaks around to try to meet demand, and it was just awful. But I can actually sit down and write an optimization model that defines the entire decision space as a polytope, and then we define an objective and we actually go search that space and find, okay, this is the right corner where we can, we can actually solve this problem and provide a schedule back. We actually wrote it up in a language, uh, this is .lp format, that uh, stands for linear program. This is horrifying, but this is what the model looks like before you run it, and out pops the schedule, shove it back in Excel. So now I can provide this point, just means you're on point, meaning you're answering chat. It actually picks lunch breaks for people, picks when you should do email as opposed to chat. And so the cool thing here was I was able to do what I know how to do, which is data science, and the support folks actually got to go back into support and do chat, which is what they know how to do. You don't want me talking to customers, and you don't want them figuring out the schedule. So this is just a better use of everyone's resources. So this was an internal engagement, just do this as a one-off and uh, do the schedule for folks. And something that I learned very quickly doing analytics is that Data science folks should just really quickly, everyone familiar with Kobayashi Maru, this whole thing from the many Star Trek shows where Kirk goes in and he has to play some game that's unbeatable, so he just changes the rules of the game so that he can win because he just wants to win. Uh, data science folks should think like this, which is to say, if a model's not working out, you should always ask yourself, can we just change the business? You know, as opposed to somehow optimally solving this problem, can we just stop doing this thing I'm trying to solve? In the case of scheduling, uh, we had this point at 10.30 every day where we never met demand ever because, or for chat because we had a 6 a.m. shift. They would hit their lunch break at that point, and then we had an 8 a.m. shift that hadn't really gotten, on, gotten their sea legs yet. And so we just stopped and said, you know what, maybe we need to just not run support that way anymore. Maybe we need to not have a lunch break there. Let's just change the way we do things. So the model kept failing, so we just said we're going to change the way we do this chat support thing. You can always do that, and so you should think like that. Just if you hit a brick wall with some analytics thing you're doing, don't be afraid to raise it to management and just say, hey, can we just change the way we do business? That's fine. Okay, external insights. I'm gonna go real quickly through this because this is not the fun stuff in the talk. Um, recently, Gmail rolled out tabbed inboxes, so there's like the promotions tab, the social tab. A lot of marketing email no, now goes to the promotions tab, and so our users wanted to understand how does this affect my business. And so <coughs> the data science team can actually answer this question, right? So we can actually dig into our data. We send six billion emails a month. We get back all the opens and clicks. We can see, okay, for Gmail recipients, now that they've got this tab where a lot of their MailChimp email is going to be on the promotions tab, <coughs> which is really annoying to me because even, um, even nonprofits get their email on the promotions tab. Um, what happened? So we can actually look, this is three weeks before and after tabs were introduced, 
and we can see about a raw 1% difference, so maybe about a 10% decrease in engagement. We've got three weeks, blue is weekday, yellow is uh, weekend, and these are open rates. So you can see that on average in the system for Gmail, open rates fell from about 13 to 12, or 13% to 12%. So we're just able to provide this to users so they could understand, hey, this is what's going to happen to you. Similarly, during the government shutdown, for our users that sent to a lot of government email addresses, we could say, hey, here's about what we're seeing. So this is engagement after the shutdown as a percentage of before the shutdown. Interestingly enough, the SEC was like all essential personnel. So their trend actually followed the, the seasonal trend we have and just upticks of engagement because people are sending a lot right now because of the holidays. So they were doing fine. State Department is doing fine. Down there at the bottom, EPA was like garbage, right? 10% of the engagement after the shutdown is before. And so you have to ask, is the, are these essential people? Are these people that just refuse to stop checking their email? Um, I don't blame them. So we could just provide this to users and help them say, just help them understand, hey, if you send to a lot of these addresses, just know this is what's going to happen. So those are just some examples of research, right, where we can provide blog posts, reports, et cetera, and we do a lot of this to our users just to say, hey, this is what's going on. You should think about when you write a subject line, write it like this. When you craft content, you should craft it like this. So that kind of research is fun. We've got a lot of data. Um, but what's more fun are building tools. So I'm going to talk about the first tool that I got to build at MailChimp, which was for the compliance team. And the way you should think about this is weapons development. Um, we built the nuclear bomb, and then this kind of technology trickles down through the rest of the company, which is really fun. So compliance. These people shut down bad users. So that's why I call it weapons development, is we wanted to help the compliance team shut down bad users. They had turned into the TSA where every time a bad user got through, they developed a new rule around how you shut down people like that. And so I did an audit of how you ended up in the compliance queue, and it looked like this. It was just awful. There are all sorts of reasons why you'd end up in there, and you might languish in the queue. Um, the compliance team was scaling linearly with the company as we grew, which kind of stinks, because once you hit 4 million users, then you need a lot of people shutting down bad folks, which is really tough, because they're not, you know, they're not focused on the good parts of the business. It's just, it seems like a bad business to be in. But we had to do it because if anyone sent spam through us, Gmail, Hotmail, et cetera, might block one of our sending IP addresses, and then that would affect all the other users who use those IP addresses. So one of the things I noticed that was particularly bad is we would review people in compliance who just tried to purchase an account. They uploaded a large list. They tried to buy something that was high dollar or they requested high volume approval. So these people just wanted to send a lot of email. And we said, no, you can't send a lot of email because that is scary. Um, so this is a really bad position to be in that a sixth of our compliance tickets had nothing to do with being bad. We just wanted to vet you. And people have an expectation with web companies that they can just sign up and go. So they don't want to be vetted uh, in a 24 hour period. That's just really rough. And so we get a lot of exit quotes like this for people who get stuck in compliance where they'd say things like, bullshit review process. I'm going to tell all my friends that this is a pain in the ass. And that's what this guy said. And then they run away. Um, so I wanted to make sure, I mean, this could have been a bad guy. I don't know. But if this was a good guy, I wanted to make sure that this person wasn't pissed off. Right? So how do I do that? Well, we build an AI model that can actually predict if a user is bad or not before they send when they enter the system, right? So now we don't have to shut people down. We can look at their data as a user, so their user metadata, the list of email addresses they bring into the system. We've probably seen all of those email addresses before. So what other stuff have they gotten? Where are they located? Do they all seem to be part of the same audience? You know, what's going on there? We can look at all that. Are they stolen addresses? Are they, are they available for purchase on the black market? Uh, and we can look at the content. So we can look at all this stuff and just make a prediction. This is actually a diagram of the AI models. It's got some intermediate models, rolls everything up to a single row, and then makes a prediction. This user sucks. This user is good. And if my goal is to worry about the user experience, then I really don't care about using sexy tools, right? I want to use whatever gets the system up and running as fast as possible so that I can improve the user experience as fast as possible. And I want it to be uh, something that will be stable and will stay up for a long time. So we chose our tools accordingly. 
For our slow storage, we use sharded Postgres because our devs are really comfortable with that. It's extremely stable. It did everything we wanted it to do, like window functions. Uh, for our fast storage, we use Redis. Uh, we've got one dossier per email address of all the email addresses we've ever seen, so billions of unique addresses and a bunch of events about everything they've engaged with in the past. Uh, we used R because there's a great community around it, Random Forest because it's hard to overtrain. So we're just really looking for stability, like a 1950s family, hence the picture. And so the cool thing is, is once we build these internal tools and systems, then we get to use them to build fun products for the general user base. So we built this weapon, but now we can just take all of these tools and expose them to our good users, which is what I think is a lot of fun. This here is a graph. It's really dark, so you probably can't see it. I took a list of 200,000 email addresses from one of our users and looked up all their other subscriptions in our system because most email addresses in MailChimp tend to be subscribed to more than one thing. And because of that, I can now find communities of interest. Um, maybe it's based on politics. Maybe it's based on CrossFit. Whatever, I can find these little communities of interest for users and expose that, hey, did you know these people on your list are interested in this? So how are we going to use that? Well, there's some obvious stuff we can do with this big network. The first thing we can do, since you're subscribed to multiple things, we can do send time optimization. If you sign up with us, even if you haven't sent with us, Someone else has sent to all these email addresses before, various people to various addresses. We know when people are engaging with their inbox, so we can kind of tell you, hey, in this particular example, time slot eight has a bunch of engagement, not a bunch of sends, meaning people are coming back to the inbox to engage at that time. That'd probably be a good time to have your stuff in their inbox. We can determine demographic data. We can predict demographic data. So you might just have an email address, but truth is someone else in the system probably has merge tag data in there, like a first name. Even if that first name is not a real first name, so it could be a misspelling like Verancia. It could be a made up name like Hitman. Those still tend to, <coughs> at some point in the system, be associated with gender, so I can still predict gender. So our model even says, hey, if somewhere in the system your first name is Hitman, you're probably a guy. Um, similarly, if we can't find any information, <coughs> we can still use trigrams or tokens from your email address prefix. So MOH tends to be highly male because it's associated with Muhammad, and there aren't a lot of female analogs to that. HN period is in my email address. It's at the end of John. It tends to not be anywhere else but at the end of John. So HN period tends to be highly male. GRL tends to be highly female, so we can use that. And then also we can go into the graph and just look at subscription data. Okay, I can look at the people on my list, but some of them might also be on Trunk Club or Stitch Fix. Both of them send through us. Stitch Fix is highly female. Trunk Club is highly male. Anyone use those two products here? Yeah, okay, got some Trunk Club people in the back. It's really cool. They just send you like a box of clothes, and then you try them on, and then you send back what you didn't like. Um, but So we can actually determine a lot of demographic data through this. Uh, age, gender, things like that. But the hard part about making tools for the customer is that these things are both technically harder than making insights, right, because not one-off, but they're also hard to communicate, right, because our users just want to get in and get out of the system. They're not there necessarily to spend a ton of time. Uh, it's very hard to communicate with them versus making internal tools. So this is really the hardest corner of this whole thing. So how are we going to do that? I'll show you an example of how we decided we were going to release data tools. Um, discovered segments. So the way discovered segments works, if you think about that graph I showed, is um, I upload as a user, I upload a list into the system, and I provide <coughs> to discovered segments, I'll provide a, a segment of people who have something in common. right? So hey, these people are all graphic designers on my list. And you tell the system, hey, can you find me other graphic designers? And the way that it does that is it represents the, the graph of subscription data, engagement data, and says, OK, I can perform some kind of cosine similarity calculation on it. It's actually slightly modified for us. But just tries to find people who are as close to your segment you provided as they are to each other, right? And so these people live in that neighborhood, and so they should be part of your segment. So this is a way to bootstrap a segment from some known smaller group of email addresses you know something about. This is really helpful for businesses that have a really large list, like a million email addresses, and just don't know everyone on it. Uh, so here's an example. MailChimp has a list of four million people. Most of them are our users, and we send a newsletter out saying, hey, just so you know, we've got a new version out here, the new features. Um, 
I grabbed some email addresses of tech journalists and threw it into discovered segments here. So Ars Technica, Read, Write, Web. And how am I going to turn this into a tool? I'm just going to put a button there that says discover similar subscribers, right? So there is no need for a graph. There is no need for data visualization. Um, I want the user experience of the data science tools in MailChimp to feel like anything else, right? And so a lot of our users are... Um, they, they, they have other jobs. They don't really care about data science, right? They might just be manning a front desk somewhere, and they also have to send out the company newsletter, right? So they might be willing to do some of this uh, unsupervised data mining, but they don't really care about the data viz. It doesn't help them anyway. It's very different from this, right, to just have a button. But this works. They use this. So that's really cool. So here are some examples of, of folks that have used it. The one on the left is me. Um, we wanted to send a newsletter out to Dev saying, hey, if you use MailChimp, just so you know, we also have an email uh, product called Mandrill where you send transactional email over it via an API. It's super fast. It's super awesome. Go use it. So rather than send this out to 4 million users, we took a group of devs that we knew about, threw it into discovered segments, grabbed some more, and then sent it out and actually got 50% better engagement on that newsletter than typical. Similarly, on the right, we've got one from a retailer here uh, where they did a bunch of data mining around their recipients, customized the, the content for various communities, and ended up getting a 200% uplift in revenue from the newsletter. So just some parting thoughts, and then I'll open up for questions. Uh, we're headed, where we're headed as a company is just trying to make data more valuable inside of the application than outside so that people get into MailChimp and love how it enriches their data and just want to stay there, right? Some things that I've learned as a data scientist at a non-analytics company, uh, it's good to just align yourself with the goals of the organization and serve your colleagues, right? If they need help, help them out. You're not supposed to be some rock star necessarily or be in the front of the organization. If people need help and data can help them, then bring data to bear on that problem. Uh, data science products should receive no special treatment. If a designer can do a better job solving a problem by changing the color of a form than I can do with some AI model or something, then that design product should win. Uh, just because you use big data does not mean that that your product should live. If it sucks, you should kill it. You should get a goal before you build something and before you acquire tools. Figure out exactly what you want to do with your analytics project and then acquire the tools to make that happen rather than saying, oh, I really want to use that new tool because it's really awesome. It does X or Y. So I'm going to come up with something that uses it. Um, that's not a really great way to engage in data science as a company. And then the last one, just avoid complexity. If you get hit by a bus, can your AI model live once you're gone? If the answer is no, think about ways of simplifying it that, that still meet the needs of the business. Uh, final thoughts, I've got a book coming out next week uh, that's an intro to data science in spreadsheets. So if you're like a BI analyst and want to learn more about how these algorithms actually work, like how does Boosted Trees actually work, I take you through in painstaking detail in a spreadsheet which is awesome, chapter after chapter. <laughs> so um, it's out in a week. Check it out. Great stocking stuffer. This is a good picture of you, too. Thank you, John.